Since this week's video is all about taking your first steps as a GM, I thought this Kickstarter, which came across my desk the other day, would be absolutely perfect to look at if you are serious about getting into it. Now, it's called Patero's Tome of Adventure. And uh, Patero is someone who's been very, very, very busy because this is a 300 page plus book of adventures. It's packed with at least 12. Now, I say at least 12 because as the stretch calls get unlocked, they add more and more adventures. And it's beautifully laid out. You get all of these different types of adventures. There's all sorts of pledge options for you to, to, to look at. There is a PDF that's available. You can choose your favorite VTT to get a license for that VTT. So you have no excuse not to use this book. It's it's crammed with a few new monsters per adventure, a few new magical items, new ideas. Just It's just really, really cool. And of course, there are so many extra bonuses that you get too. Some nice shiny dice, some player handout maps, uh, it, player prompts. It's just awesome. And lots of battle maps as well. So I would really, really recommend that if you are interested in starting to explore this idea of being a GM, come and support Patero's Tome of Adventure on Kickstarter now. In the next few minutes, you are going to GM your first game if you haven't ever done it before. And you don't need anybody around the table, just you and me and this video. Let's do it! Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today, if you have never GM'd before, if you are worried about GMing, if you are afraid to GM, if you think you can't do it, if you are someone who says, I don't have a good imagination, I don't know what to do, I panic, I this, I that, we are going to role play right now. Well, in a little bit once I've explained to you the concept. So, all I need you to do is clear your mind, Clear the space that you're in, just focus on the video. And more importantly, focus on my voice. No, seriously, just relax. Sit back, we're gonna have some fun today. That's all that today's video is about. If you're hoping to learn something, well, maybe if you've never GM before, you'll learn that you can actually GM. All right, so in your calm space, I want you to describe a small room. It must have two doors and a single window. Go ahead, describe it. You can write it down, you can say it out verbally, that would be best. I know it's weird to speak out aloud on your own, but trust me, just describe the room. Take a moment, pause the video. Perhaps you describe the room as, it's a room. It has four walls, a white ceiling, gray carpeted floor, there's a door on the east side, there's a door on the north side, and there's a window on the south side. You could have done that. I would advise that you pick your favorite role-playing game or pick a role-playing game that you think you would like to play in. Perhaps that's Call of Cthulhu, or maybe it's Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe it's Star Trek, doesn't matter. Whichever one it is, apply that to your room if you didn't already do so. So what would a room be like in Call of Cthulhu? Well, if you don't know anything about Call of Cthulhu, well, Perhaps maybe Call of Cthulhu is not the right way to go. But if you know something about Call of Cthulhu, it's a Lovecraftian horror-esque kind of situation. So perhaps you might describe the room as being, it's a rundown, shabby space. Wooden paneling peeks out from wallpaper that slowly peels away from the edges and reveals black mold growing underneath. One door ahead of you is hanging on its hinges forlornly squeaking as wind slowly tries to break its way into the room. Another on the other side is heavily barred and padlocked. At least five padlocks are in place, all old and rusted. Written on the door it says, do not open. There is a window, though it has been heavily boarded up. Planks badly hammered to the walls. You can see that there is some blood on those wooden planks on the walls. Something tried to get out, not in. I mean, you could do that. You could do whatever it is that came to mind. Be as fanciful, as creative, or not. It really doesn't matter. If it's Dungeons and Dragons, you're in a stone room. The stone is adequately carved. 
well placed, probably not dwarven, definitely not elvish by the style of the lintel above the door, but functional. Humans probably built this place. There's a door in the north, there's a door in the south. Both are heavy wooden doors with a single heavy bar across each door, preventing them from being opened. A grilled window to the south has bars that prevent exit or entry. That's it. You don't have to go any more crazy than that. All right, take a few moments, adjust your description of the room with two doors and one window. Right, now we're going to take another step because the first one wasn't hard. Was it hard? Hopefully it wasn't too difficult. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to answer three questions, just three little questions. First question, question number one. What do I see out of the window? When I look out of the window, what do I see? Do I see rolling meadows? Do I see caves? Do I see darkness? Do I see mountains? Do I see a field filled with cows and sheep slowly eating one another? What do I see when I look out of your window? Just take a moment and describe what I see. Bear in mind what your role-playing system is, if it's Cthulhu or Dungeons and Dragons, try and find something appropriate to that setting. Now that you know what we can see out of the window, even if it is through a crack in the boards, now that you know what's there, the next question. Question two. What do I hear behind door number one? What do I hear behind door number one? So hopefully you've written something that you can hear. Shuffling. Nothing. The void. Only history responds in its silent, judgmental way, staring back at you over thousands of years. Uh, you do what you need to do. Just describe what we hear behind door number two, uh, number one. And then thirdly, the very last thing, what does door number two feel like and why won't it open? What does it feel like and why won't it open? Does it feel rough, smooth, cold? slightly warm around the edges? Does it feel slightly wobbly? Does it feel hard? All of these options, all of these adjectives are yours to take and apply as appropriate. It's very, very easy steps here, folks. Now, why can't the door open? That's a good question. Why can't the door open? Is it jammed, sealed? Perhaps it's warped? Perhaps something has grown up over it? Perhaps something is holding it shut? The choice is up to you. Once you've decided, make your notes and then let's continue. Okay, now, now, behind door number one, because door number two is sealed, remember? Behind door number one, if the door is opened, there's a corridor. Keep it simple, there's just a corridor. In the corridor, there is something or someone approaching. What or who is it? Just give me a name. Don't do anything else. Just give me a name. Could be Shirley could be Bobo. Doesn't matter. Just give me a name. Any name and go. Now, here is the most complicated part of this entire journey. Apply Ogas. What is Ogas? Oh, I don't know what Ogas is. Panic! Ah, I'm running around in panic. I don't know what Ogas is. Ogas is... Ogas stands for occupation, goal, attitude, and stake. Depending on what you answer for those, depends on how the named character that's in the corridor may react to anybody opening the door that leads into the corridor. Let's go with O. An occupation. Give them an occupation. Could be as simple as a mailman. But again, try and make it appropriate to the genre that you're wanting to play in. If it's Dungeons and Dragons, mailman would possibly be better replaced with a courier. If it's Call of Cthulhu, mailman is appropriate. If it's Star Trek, data processor, droid perhaps, or maybe that feels more Star Wars. I don't know. Go ahead, fill in their ogas. What is their occupation? Once you've got their occupation, what's their goal? Now their goal shouldn't necessarily be related to the occupation. Just because they happen to be a ma mailman doesn't mean that they want to deliver the mail. That's part of their occupation. Their job is to deliver the mail. So think more along the lines of what they would like to do when they're not doing their occupation. Uh, perhaps it would be to take the dog for a walk. Or in your case, perhaps it's to take the dragon for a walk. Or to find the dragon. Or to run away from the dragon. Now think about a simple goal. Just one. Doesn't have to be overly elaborate. Just one simple little goal. Then think about their attitude. Are they aggressive? Are they angry? Are they upset? 
Are they morose? Perhaps they're happy. If you're running a Lovecraftian, perhaps they are somewhat cagey and aloof and not wanting to reveal too much too soon. And then finally, the stake. The stake is how much investment they have in the other three. Do they have a low investment in their occupation, in which case delivering the mail, they don't care if they do or if they don't. But if they have a high stake in their occupation, then they are dedicated and will deliver the mail come rain, snow, hail, sunshine, operable services, whatever. They'll deliver it one way or another. But if the stake in their attitude is very high and they're very grumpy and they want to remain grumpy and no one is going to stop them from being grumpy because they're grumpy McGrumpface, well, then they stay grumpy regardless of what happens next. But if the stake is low in their grumpy attitude and really just a little joke will make them smile and forget all about their problems, well, then that's the right way to go. So now you know what OGAS is, apply it to the person that you have added into our corridor. Now that you've got a person in the corridor or a thing in the corridor, it doesn't have to be a human being, it could be something appropriate to your setting, and you've got this room with a view of something that you've already described, now all you need to do is come up with some kind of pressure, some kind of idea <clears throat> that the players are going to have to think about in terms of pressure. Is it that the creature in the corridor is going to attack because it's a madman and their occupation is eating people and their steak is really, really, really well done over an open flame and preferably the entire body. Their steak is really high and they want to eat everything that they come across. Perhaps it is trying to get away from this thing in the corridor, something along those lines. But remember what was wrong with door number two. It wouldn't open, would it? So that's going to put pressure onto our players to try and figure out what the hell to do with this madman in a corridor and a door that won't open. At the same time, perhaps it is that the room is slowly starting to fill with water, water pouring in from the ceiling, and they need to figure out a way to escape. Is it down the corridor or do they try and get the locked door open? Or perhaps it's through the window. Or perhaps the window is letting gas into the room. Perhaps the roof is collapsing. Perhaps the entire room is shaking and spinning around as if it was in a whirlwind. Think of a difficulty. It could be anything and apply it to the situation. Now, and this is the joyful part, you get your players. And in this particular instance, the player could be you yourself. Because in this instance, you can actually play in this little game that you are GMing as well. So here's how it's going to play out. Well, perhaps you have a player. The player has a character, the character, let's say, is an investigator. Whether it's in fantasy or sci-fi or Lovecraft or wherever, it doesn't matter. You choose one appropriate. They're in this room. They're facing off against this madman who wants to try and eat them and deliver the mail at the same time because I'm crossing my uh, examples here. The door behind them is closed. The room is slowly filling up with water whilst gas is pouring in from the window and the ceiling is collapsing because the whole thing is structurally unsound. Uh, for whatever reason. I described out the window that they could see a bayou, a swamp of some kind. Well, perhaps the house is slowly sinking into the bayou and that's why the whole thing is collapsing. What do you do? Well, what would you do? Would you run around screaming, ha ha ha, the end, the end is nigh? Or would you go, right, let's have some fisticuffs, my good cannibal? Do you run to the locked door and try and rip the planks off to get through the door? Do you wait for the ceiling to collapse and try and lure the madman to the point where the ceiling is going to collapse exactly onto them and then use them as a ladder to climb out? All that you are doing right now is you are being a GM and you are role playing at the same time. That's all that GMing is, is you are creating a situation, you are creating a space, you are creating a point of contention, and then you are watching and discovering how the players are going through that. And all you're doing is just following along with what you've set up. So I hope, I hope that this is going to show you and has shown you it's super easy to be a DM. Yes, there's rules and there's this and there's that, but you've already proven that you can create a space, you can put something into that space, and then you can put the players in and they will have a fun time trying to get out. Now all you do is just create a series of those. And you decide, this one, it's terrible panic, it's danger. This one, it's relaxed. They're in a diner and no one wants to do anything bad to them. 
until they go into the back. And that's another space. And here someone does want to do something bad to them, or perhaps they are trying to do something and that causes someone to do something. Because Ogas is your friend. Every time you add an NPC, apply Ogas to them and you'll be amazed to see it that they are the ones who are going to tell you what should be happening in your space. If this has inspired you to just try and run a little, little scenario, to use Japanese, a squashy scenario, a small little amount of a scenario, a little scenario, then this video has done what it needed to do. If this was just an entertaining video, well, I mean, there's always that like button or the subscribe button if you're not yet already subscribed. But if this has inspired you to try and run your own game, even with just your parents or your mother or your sister or a significant other or your, well, maybe not your dog because unless it involves treats, your dog is not likely to make really good input into your entire space. But you get the idea. Hit that like button or the subscribe button to get more. Until next time, a huge thank you to all of you for watching all the way through to the end. A huge thank you to my patrons. And of course, as always, I wish you the happiest of gaming.